Welcome to the West Guide to Aglaia. Normally when it comes to 24 formats, I feel even the average player will do fine blind. They might die a few times, but most things they could conceivably sight read. And by their second or third run, they'll have little to no issue. Aglaia is the exception, I feel. Some mechanics are near impossible to sight read personally. Some things work the exact opposite you might expect. While I only died four times total my blind run, I constantly felt like I was being caught by gotcha traps. So don't feel bad, I struggled too, and hopefully I could push you past that struggle into understanding the mechanics. Starting with Byragot. Ordeal of Thunder is a basic raid wide. It hurts pretty hard, so make sure everyone is above half HP or more whenever it is coming up. Same for all raid wides in this area. He will immediately lead into Byragot Strike. This seems to be aimed at a random player. It is a very large knockback AoE. Stand near the edge, or use arm's length or true north to negate it. Byragot will move to that spot as he attacks, so keep that in mind for a few moments. Then comes Byragot's Ward, a simple tank buster. Mitigate decently and heal the tank back up afterwards. Build his build is redundantly redundant, but powers his hammer up for the next Byragot strike. Conal Lightning AoEs are indicated at each cardinal direction of the boss. These go off when he lands the strike. So in your mind, transplant those AoEs to approximately to where these correlate on the knockback indicator. Position yourself around the circle as he jumps based on where you feel the AoEs will go out. Whether or not you arm's length or sure cast this one, if you're in the wrong position when he lands, you will be taking damage because cones. Now for the major mechanic of the fight. He will shrink the arena by two tiles, one on the east and west, and will transform into a three column, five row set of blocks. He will summon hammers on both sides of the arena that begin to swing. If a hammer is on the right, that row of platforms will shift to the left by one tile. If to the left, the platform will shift to the right one tile. If there is a hammer on neither side, the platform will not move at all. The big thing to know is the platform moving does not move you. There will always be a middle line to stand on, one contiguous block so you don't have to do any jumping. So theoretically you could stand with the boss and never fall off. Byragot will then summon a hammer and place it on a block. It shoots an AoE across an entire column of blocks. There will also be a hammer outside the arena. If the row of blocks with the hammer shifts, the hammer will move too. So if the lightning hammer will shift, stand inside the AoE because the platforms are going to move and move it out of the way. Just make sure the row you are standing on will not also shift and move out from underneath you, depending on the direction. If the lightning hammer is not going to be moved, do not stand inside the AoE, but it seems to almost always move. A third and final set of hammers will spawn, and from what I have seen there will always be a safe spot to the north and south created when these go off. The middle three rows will always be made unsafe. The boss will move north and begin to cast Byragot Spire, decimating and knocking back everyone if they're in the middle three columns. You must get out to the outer columns after the hammer swing and create safe spots. Here there is a hammer to the left meaning the platform will shift to the right and out of the AoE path by one square. So we will all prepare to move the moment the hammer lands. Be quick as there is very little time to move once the platforms shift. Less than two seconds even. After Spire, he will turn the arena back to normal and begin to cycle through the same mechanics with only one new one. He will cast, reproduce, and summon five clones on the east side of the arena. One to a row, just like the hammers. These may be able to spawn to the west, but I've never seen it. Some of the clones will do a short flourish and capture a bolt of lightning. Do not be in the same row as these clones and get to the opposite end of the arena as all the clones, in line with the non-electrified clones. All five will attack at the same time with Garlean Fire AoE indicators. The electrified AoEs will go off extremely quickly, with the non-powered ones going off about half as fast, dodge into the rows with the fast lightning as they pass by to dodge the slow AoEs. From there you're repeating all the same mechanics, no new ones. But now he will start combining every platform movement in the hammer phase with lightning hammer placements. 
Not many mechanics and honestly the easiest boss once you know what is going on. A blind run though, fairly rough. The trash mob afterwards is pretty simple. He has a frontal AoE called Destructive Static. Be behind him if you see him turn. Then there is this long cast with no name unless you get hit by it. He will send two orbs in opposite directions that begin to draw lines. They will rotate 90 degrees in the same direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. When the orbs come back in and the lines close, the shapes created will be shocked. Place yourself on the line on one side and look in the direction of the orb on the other side. If you see the orb in the back move left, step to the left side of the line. If you see it move to the right, step to the right of the line. Again, this is because both orbs move in the same direction, so the one behind you is moving in the same direction. In this clip, it moves counterclockwise to end up east. As the electrocutions go off, basic AoEs will be placed on players, and then the fight will continue to repeat, with destructive statics during the lightning orbs. Then finally, one last mechanic will be AoEs on opposite sides that will radiate three times. A circle, then a small donut, then a big donut. Dodge into the safe spots as they appear. Railger the Destroyer is going to destroy you. Notice the hand arena and the edges of the fingers. There's a faint white line. Go beyond these and you die. You can fall off. His first mechanic is a basic raid wide, Lightning Rain. Heal up after, it does about the same damage as Byragot. Advent of the Eighth into Hand of the Destroyer is his main mechanic. He will place two giant portals in the back of the arena, and always in the back, never at the fingers, and two next to him. Which colors each of these are is random. Blue and red can be on either side in the background and on either side next to him, but there will always be paired portals. Watch his animation. Whichever arm he has raised up, he will punch down into the portal on that side. If he has his left arm up, he will punch to the left portal. Right arm, right portal. Match the colors of the portal he will punch and get away from it. This will punch you to death. This will repeat many times in the fight and even be combined with Broken World, the next mechanic. This summons a proximity marker that indicates the landing point for a giant meteor. Get decently far away, at least to the base of the fingers. This also prepares you for the next mechanic that goes out immediately after. Railger's Beacon is a purple AoE to denote it cannot be arm's lengthed or sure casted, as it uses the same indicator as Byragot's knockback. This one also comes with arrows pointing outwards. Stand on these arrow lines, the ones that point out to the ends of fingertips at least, and get as close to the AoE as you can safely. This is an extremely violent knockback that pushes you quite a bit beyond even just hitting the wall. If you are even just a little bit too far away from the AoE, you will slide along the finger and potentially even still fall off. Run back mid and prepare for the next advent of the 8th, same as the first one. Soon after will be Destructive Bolt, AoE tank busters that will kill anyone standing with the tank. All three tanks can very easily fit in front of the boss without moving out of range, so they can keep attacking. If tanks are not alive, it will pick a random player in the alliance of the missing tank. Mitigate and heal up after, especially the main tank. Advent of the Eighth will now go off again, but be different this time. He will only use two portals as a tutorial, showing he will only use this one possible option. Then Broken World will be used, summoning another media right in front of the portal. Go to this portal! Notice it is pointed upwards, because he's going to falcon punch the meteor, breaking it into eight or so smaller proximity markers that spread across the opposite side of the arena. If he's using the tilted portal, you are safe. Go to the meteor. From this point forward, he will use all four portals, one AoE portal, and one tilted meteor portal. If he uses the tilted portal, just run in front of it. But even if he uses the other portal, be on the same side as the Meteor Portal. Here he is using the Blue Portal, which makes that side of the arena unsafe. But the Meteor will not be punched, so that singular proximity marker will be real and you must get away from it. Run out to the fingers on the same side as the Meteor Marker. 
Anytime he doesn't pull the Chris Redfield, a bunch of players will get AoE markers around them. You have a lot of time to adjust and spread out, so don't panic. Only one mechanic remains, and that is Bronze Work. This is the most obvious of the mechanics in being just basic cardinal, then intercardinal AoEs. Dodge the first, then dodge into the first AoE to dodge the second, and be wary of the puddles that some players will be dropping. It is random who gets these, so just adjust on the fly as they come out. Finally, any further Railgus beacons will come with lightning balls. Only one finger will be safe. All others have lightning orbs. So check where the lines go and make sure there is no lightning orbs. Then from there, the mechanics will repeat with no further additions. Next, trash mobs are even easier. One will do a donut, the other a circular AoE. The number of the dots over their heads determines who attacks first and second. Focus down one at a time, as they will revert to a much easier mechanic when alone. Even easier than it already was. The difficulty of the paired AoEs is being able to properly recognize which is the circle and which is the donut. Azamer is probably the easiest boss on a blind run, but also the most complex. Warden's prominence is her raid-wide, and seemingly hurts a little more than the previous two bosses. Key players healed up a little bit extra. Solar Wings is her first mechanic, doing large cones to her left and right. Be in front or behind, or just follow where the safe spots end up being. Note the orbs that appear due to Solar Wings. Stay away from them as they will explode. But make note of these for in a little bit, these do more. Next is her tank buster, Warden's Warmth. These are a bit bigger than Railgus Tank Buster, but all three tanks can still easily fit around the front of the boss just fine. Mitigate and heal, once again, if tanks are missing, it will pick random players, or maybe it's the highest aggro. Solar Wings will happen again, but this time will be followed into Sun's Shine. This summons clones to play soccer. Like E6 from the Eden fights, if you've done that. Each clone will have a directional arrow to denote where they will be pushing an orb. If you imagine the arena as a 3x3 square, you can think of the orbs being moved one square in the direction the clone is pointing when the cast bars go off. Run to any of the clones to get a safe spot, with all three clones making the middle unsafe. Simply put, clones move orbs, get to where there will be no orbs. Solar Fans is the easiest mechanic in the entire raid. She will forcibly face a random cardinal direction and do AoE lines in the cardinal directions her sides are pointing at. Dodge into these AoEs. Radiant Rhythm will go off, causing the fans to begin to rotate in the same direction 90 degrees each time. This seemingly always happens five times in a row, meaning if the fans start north and south like here, they will always end up east and west. So if you stand right on the arrows that mark the middle of her flanks when the fans explode, you will be safe. And be sure to be outside of her hitbox as the explosions are huge and do reach into the middle of the arena. There will be another tank buster into Fleeting Spark. Run behind her anytime you see this cast. You can see the indicator under her being shown as she is channeling, but the easier to see indicator is just the front arrow, or the open rear positional indicator. She will use this in more annoying points, so be ready to adjust. Solar Fold will do a plus-shaped AoE in the cardinal directions, leaving behind small bits of fire. If you have done Pandemonium, you know this mechanic as Devouring Brand. These lines will begin to expand and divide the arena into four sections. However, there's an added hitch. She will also use Sun's Shine to summon clones. Stand in the same section as either of these clones and look towards them. They will have wind on their fans. This is them trying to show that they will be throwing gusts of wind clockwise to their lefts. This wind will blow into the fire lines and engulf the section one segment clockwise. If you are in the wrong section, run across the fire. You can survive, but it will hurt. And the fire gusts will quickly kill you if you stay in them so take the hit of the line if you are already in the wrong spot. Again, the wind all goes clockwise. If it can go counterclockwise, I have not seen it, and nobody I've asked has seen it go counterclockwise. So, the simple solution of this mechanic ends up being, always go clockwise of any section 
without a clone. Since the wind always goes clockwise, anywhere that is clockwise from an empty space should always be safe. Be sure to heal up anyone who managed to survive taking fire damage, as Warden's prominence typically follows this. The fire hurts a lot, so you need to be ready to just dump all your resources to save anyone you can. Save Swiftcast for any raising you need to do. Wildfire Ward is next, and don't accidentally hit arm's length like I do, or you may end up getting extremely confused. Yeah, that's how I messed this up. The entire arena, except for the triangle in the middle, will begin to burn, and three clones will dash on the outside of the arena. Pay attention to the direction of the arrows appearing, and from where. This is the order they will go off. These are knockbacks, and you want to aim for the small triangle point from the middle of the side. Side to point, side to point, side to point. Or, you know, actually hit arm's length at the right time, and just ignore them all. One final mechanic is Noble Dawn. This summons a small sun in the middle of the arena, which will throw sunspots all around the arena three times. These will slowly grow for a few seconds before exploding. Prioritize moving into safe spots, worrying only about the biggest circles at the moment. You don't need to worry too much about watching every single placement, but it can help. Movement speed as a base is faster than the expansion of the circles, so there's a lot of leeway. In the best case scenario, you dodge from where the third explosions will be into where the first explosions happen. Run back to the middle after the third explosion and get behind wherever the boss is. She's going to kick the sun with Sublime Sunset. It will flash as a proximity marker as the cast is ending. Right behind the boss is more than enough distance to survive, but ranged players can move a little bit further if they have no casting to do. From there, mechanics will just repeat. The things to be concerned about are the aforementioned fleeting spark usages, and there being three clones for every future solar fold. But again, just be clockwise of the singular empty space. Oh, and Soccer has four clones now. They will be in pairs. The second clone will be kicking the orb into where the first clone's orb was. So run to where the second clone in line is. Otherwise, mechanics will just be repeating. Null Ball is the most abstract of the fights, but it's understandable as well. A lot of his mechanic names, just ignore them. For example, his first mechanic, as above, so below, has nothing to do with the mechanic's actual execution, despite it being very seemingly so. Instead, look at his head, look at the background, and look at the things floating around him. They're all blue. Most of the arena is blue, and there is red under him. The color of all the different tells is the actual mechanic that is going to go off. So because everything is blue, red is safe, so we want to get under him. Then he'll do the mechanic again, but this time he'll wave his arms in the air before spinning his head around. This will change the colors to red, making red unsafe. You don't need to watch for the flourish, just the background, but I at least had to mention that he does that anytime his head is going to spin. Just worry about the colors though, unless you are colorblind. If you are colorblind, I believe he will always have the blue fire when he is in this mode with this many fire spouts, and moving his head to one big fire spout is always red. The like lanterns that float around will always have accents above when red is going off, and below when blue is going off. And it seems mechanics are always consistent, so red is always dead center, blue is always the outside. From this point forward, I believe every as above, so below can cause him to spin his head, so you will need to react with whichever tells you are able to use. Next is Heaven's Trial, with four mechanics. One player has a stack marker, and three have Conal Earthshaker markers. Have those three players loosely spread, and stop moving. Have them move to max melee range 2, outside of the boss. Then the stack marker can stack under the boss, outside of the AoE markers. The alliance is likely all over the place, and under the boss is the closest center point without having to cross over the AoEs. Don't get hit by both, or you will die. Even with most players in the stack, this acts as if a raid wide went off and does as much damage as his aim is raid wide. And then I believe every Heaven's Trial can instead be Hell's Trial in any further place where a trial happens. This first one seemingly is always Heaven's Trial, 
Helve's Trial is just a basic AoE. This first time though will immediately lead into Golden Tenet, a tank buster stack. The three orbs floating in the air means it wants all three tanks to go in and stack. The other possible tank buster option is Stygian Tenet, which is the same with each tank getting a marker that they have to loosely spread out for, and can kill other players. The size is the same as Railgers. Cooldown to mitigate the damage and heal up after. That goes for all three of you. As above, so below comes in next with a different version. Three players will get blue markers with arrows denoting AoEs that chase. One player will get a red stack marker that is a line. Once again, only one of these will go off based on the tells. Head, color, shape of the lanterns. If the background is red, ignore the blue markers. They don't exist. If the background is blue, ignore the stack. That does not exist. Neither will begin until after the cast bar. If it is the red stack, it resolves immediately. If it is the blue chase hit AoEs, those players must run out and around for a little bit, staying away from where their AoEs are coming. It seems to explode five times total. They don't need to run out until after the marks are placed. You don't need to leave the boss until the cast bar ends. But if they're not melee, they might as well move out ASAP. A third version of As Above So Below is next, this time with red and blue circles with arrows. These will explode and continue to explode in the direction of the arrows, repeatedly, until it hits the edge of the arena. Simply stand between the two sets of the safe color so you're at the opposite side of the arena of the unsafe color. These do also have a colorblind tell. The blue AoEs have wiggly lines pointing out of the center. Red arrows have spikes coming out of the center. It's very subtle, but hopefully not impossible to tell if you are colorblind. I see no other way to do this besides follow everyone else, so look for the spikes if you can. Hellofire is a frontal or rear cleave, denoted by the giant rays of purple. Avoid the side these are on, and he can do the flourish and spin his head, causing the AoE to go from frontal to rear. Wayward Soul, I believe, is the longest mechanic. Orbs will appear in the sky and rain down, creating large explosions as they land. You get a millisecond to see the size of the AoEs indicated on the ground as the orbs spawn. Just get away from the orbs and far. There are three possible patterns with the arena essentially segmented into a hexagon, six points. Two orbs on opposite ends with the third orb being right next to either of the opposing orbs. All three orbs on the same side, and as I call it, Act 4. The finale to this mechanic is all six points exploding in a circular pattern. It can go either clockwise or counterclockwise. Just keep running around the boss in the direction needed. There's lots of safe space for this one, so melees can keep hitting fine. Be right up next to the boss and you can easily spin around as the explosions happen. He will do another hell of fire before doing his final mechanic. Fired up. Watch above his head or look at the diamonds being placed in the arena where the tethers are. There will be icons denoting whether each diamond will be a knockback or a circular AoE, which is pretty big. It will disappear after the cast completes and the next diamond is channeled. Pulsing arrows is a knockback. Blue circle is an AoE. Remember which place diamond is which as he casts Fortune's Flux. This will set the mechanics to all go off. Here, the one diamond was knockback, and two is AoE. These will go off very quickly back to back, essentially at the same time. Meaning, going to one, I need to get knocked back away from the two diamonds, as he will do an AoE there. There are many possible patterns to this, but it all boils down to don't be knocked back into walls or the next marker if the next marker is the AoE. But finally, we have Soul's Measure, splitting the arena in two and spawning three adds. They can spawn in different patterns. They can all be on one side, or two on one side and one on the other. They will tether to your parties, splitting you all up for the coming mechanics. Please point these adds outside the arena instead of towards the middle. You should never point enemies at the party. This has been true since Sestasha. Also, by the way, you're killing one of your party members. First, they will do a conal AoE you want to point outward so you don't hit people. 
Then each party will get a stack marker. Otherwise, it's really simple. Just kill them where they stand. Then it becomes a life or death mechanic. Fail this and it's an instant wipe no matter what. The clones will have weights and all players will have weights. Dolls can have a weight of two or three as far as I've seen, and it's not consistent which weights they are. They could be all twos, it could be all threes, there could be a mix. Ignore all of this and just look in the background. There is a glowing scale. You want this evenly balanced, not tilted. If the scale is tilted to one side, have some players move over to the other side to give the lighter side more weight. There is no simple way to do this like just go to the opposite side of your doll. You all just have to adjust. Be willing to adjust, but don't jump the gun. Watch the scale and make sure it is even. If you all wipe still, you can set a priority like tanks and healers move first, all DPS just stand still wherever they ended up. If you survive, you will take a bit of damage that you just heal up. Then the fight continues with all the same mechanics. Nothing new happens at this point. The most new would be As Above, So Below. Now combines multiple mechanics. So the in and out, plus the line stack or the chaser AoEs. Otherwise, this is every mechanic. Good luck and congrats on beating four of the twelve... Uh, the twelve. Thank you for watching this quick little 24-man guide I whipped up. I felt this was needed personally. I've gotten past the trouble with my first run, but I know others might still struggle or not understand why mechanics are going on. And there's still lots of people who are going in blind too, who don't want to go in blind. I really did feel like this raid was extra confusing as a blind run, and didn't have as good as understanding as it could have had. But take care and may the power of Anna did Hogsley waste to your enemies. And special thanks to all my patrons over on Patreon. If it weren't for them, I wouldn't be able to do videos like this. And an extra, extra special thanks to... Ashtree Dweller, Eamon al Khatib, Benjamin Hahn, Benjamin Haynes, Benjamin Rice, Zadir Diosasan, Serix, Drun Maton, Ethan Olsen, Frazier, Greg, James Hall, JB Hruska, Jericho, Kevin Lowe, Link Hughes, Marlon Sebo, Matthew Simmons, Mizella, Naja Shots Fired, Nick Griffin, Paxton Lancaster, Poppins205, Ronald J. Carney, Sophia X, T Rogue, Ticklefinger, Timmy, Tabood, and Zero Two. If you would like to add your support, the link is down below in the description. Thank you for watching.